I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Butler Lee for six months now. And I can tell you with some certainty that he typifies at least three what some may call old-fashioned virtues. One is duty. Dr. Butler is driven by duty. When he says yes to a responsibility, he embraces it with his whole being, his whole nephish, as Dr. Davison would say. And he carries it out in every particularity. And here's the second old-fashioned virtue, honor. Now, I know honor carries a somewhat shameful past. It's associated with the values of white male hegemony. But in Lee, honor is transformed into an integrity of his whole being, into dignity, into valuing himself as he values others. And he values us so much that when he responds, he responds thoughtfully, carefully. He is a man of honor. And then there's that passion, a passion for the kind of justice that would seep into the very cells of our bodies and transform us inside out. But you don't really know him until you've sat with him in a biker bar in the Kendall Whittier area of Tulsa at about 5.30 when bikers really don't seem to hang out drinking Prosecco in plastic cups. Lee, we are so glad you are among us here at Phillips Theological Seminary, and we look forward to your second presentation with anticipation and receptivity. Welcome to this second installment of my two-part lecture. This lecture will focus on the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. The Declaration of Independence declared the fight for freedom to be a sacred act of the human spirit. The fight for freedom, deemed as the endowed inalienable right and responsibility of every man meant fighting to break the yoke of oppression. From the Declaration through the Continental Congress that developed the Constitution of the United States of America, freedom was the action of any white American who staked the claim and owned land. Freedom was regarded as white humanity, and unfreedom was regarded as colored bodies that were deemed less than human. As a result, whiteness became a privileged construct that defined white people as divinely blessed beings with dominion. This ideological embrace of freedom resulted in the war between the states. And although the Civil War ended in 1865, the dynamics of the post-bellum period challenged the meaning of freedom in the United States. As I think about American history and an American future, I'm guided by the critical thoughts and emphases of Dr. Charles Long, and I ask the question, what orients and mediates the American definition of freedom on a time continuum? Although there is a statement of progress undergird by 
a social theory of evolution. I'm more persuaded that there is a cyclical repeating of history, being represented as new events that emerge from a forgotten or revisionist history. This address is case study number two from the history of the state of Oklahoma. Today, I will present an analysis of the 1921 massacre in Tulsa as an act of terrorism and ritualized sacrifice reenacted to preserve a white ideology of freedom that denies freedom for all. There's always a challenge of where on a timeline one begins to interpret a historical event. Beginning with the event itself may result in a false presentation on why an incident actually occurred. As an example, in 1491, America was lost. But in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And America, which was lost, was miraculously found. Telling the story of America grounded in a narrative of conquest completely denies the history of the indigenous. The conqueror reshapes history into its own image through a social narcissism that completely disregards the existence of an other. Social narcissism thrives on revisionist history or what today might be called alternative facts. Where social narcissists do not like the story being told, they declare fake news and rewrite the story to meet their own needs. In the case of the Americas, the history of the land has been revised to ignore the history and the stories of the blood that soaks the soil from conquest and colonization. When social narcissists tell a story using alternative facts, they will emphasize that you have the right story, just the wrong facts as you narrate the story. This is my assessment of a sermon preached in Tulsa by a Methodist bishop, Edwin Muzen, on the Sunday following the race massacre. He titled his sermon, Tulsa's Race Riot and the Teachings of Jesus, to which he declares, this is a startling association phrase. And yet, if we are Christians, we must dare to put these phrases down side by side and look at the riot which has disgraced our city in the light of the teachings of him who is the master of our thinking and the Lord of our lives. If the Christian preacher has any message at all, he must not hesitate now to speak out his deepest convictions, touching the applications of the ethics of Jesus to such conditions as these in the midst of which we find ourselves. While his opening to his sermon sounds quite reasonable, his interpretation of the massacre casts doubt on the skills of his interpretation as he looks at this social milieu out of a lens of Christian theology on race. 
He presents alternative facts and offers a revisionist history on the precipitating events. His sermonic retelling of the Tulsa race massacre and the destruction of the Greenwood District concluded that peaceful whites needed to protect their community from immoral blacks. Bishop Moosen's interpretive gaze was empowered by a social system that Mark Kahn describes as, whites could use violence against blacks with impunity, but black violence against white was severely prosecuted and punished, end quote. Such a revisionist Christian history of the massacre cannot be permitted to stand. To get behind the race, the social narcissism of his theology and truly understand the 1921 race massacre in the West, it's imperative that we deconstruct the course of human events and reevaluate the theological anthropology that resulted in the validation of a massacre. In order to reframe and set the crooked straight, I look to the East Coast events that were experienced as challenges during the formation of the New Republic. I suspected that many of the challenges that shaped the colonies into a nation were the same challenges that shaped the territories into a state. Looking to the East, as different peoples of the British Empire traversed the Atlantic to find a home and build a future in America, New pathways for citizenship were established through the mediation of whiteness. Because all whites did not have equal opportunity in the pursuit of happiness, freedom was experienced as an elusive guiding myth. Whereas whiteness was an early qualification for American citizenship, becoming white was essential for having the opportunity to vote within the new nation. As different ethnic groups came to be identified as white, they slowly began to experience the benefits of American citizenship. As a result, it was the color line that distinguished one's ability to build a future through hard work from one, from the one whose hard work under slavement provided no hope to build a future. So one could work hard and have a future and the other worked hard without a future. The meaning of whiteness for America was clearly articulated by Thomas Jefferson in query 14 of his Notes on the State of Virginia, written in 1785. Jefferson's reflections can actually be seen as a handbook on the Southern ideology on race, filled with the descriptions of what he believed to be the hierarchical differences between whites, Native Americans, and Blacks. Jefferson elaborates his thoughts on why Africans in America, if emancipated, should be sent to Africa or some other location away from the possibility of mixing with whites. In other words, if Africans were to remain in America, according to Jefferson, Africans are to remain an enslaved population. But if emancipated, Africans are to be sent away 
to colonize some other land outside of America. From Jefferson's perspective, Africans were never to be accepted as Americans. This ideology has been embraced by many throughout American history, especially as a means for keeping America as a white nation. Although notes on the state of Virginia was not a manifesto for violence, it can be interpreted as a resource that informed the rise of the Confederacy. Jefferson's degrading attitude toward Africans and his feeling that Africans and whites continuing to live together would end by one group exterminating the other are descriptive of the biased tensions that inculcate and infect notions of freedom in America. His description further gives substance to the concept of slaveocracy, which informed America through and beyond the Civil War. The ending of the Civil War has often been interpreted to say that the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 and the suppression of the rebellion against the Union in 1865 freed the enslaved. But the transfer of power did not convert the South. The heart of Dixie never totally surrendered its fundamental convictions. In so many different ways, slavery was the Southerner's lover who was kidnapped. And just as the mythical Helen of Troy was the face that launched the thousand ships, the enslaved African was the coveted property that provoked national devastation. It does not matter that the Southerner was an abusive, victimizing rapist. The Southerner or the Southern perpetrator described their experience as victimization when its sex toy escaped or was stolen by Union's outside agitation. This action sparked both despair and rage. Not only was it important for the Confederacy to reclaim its stolen property, it was equally important for the Confederacy to punish the one who stole and ransomed their object of pleasure. After the Confederacy was demoralized by losing the war, losing property and prosperity, Southerners recalled the glory days as they blamed others for their misfortune and loss of power. They could not navigate a society in which bodies that were once their property had to be respected as equal human beings. Bodies they believed to be cursed, yet were being supported and given privileges by an oppressive government. In their frustration and suffering, overwhelmed by a stalled economy, clinging to their symbols of pride like the Confederate flag, they declared the South will rise again. Threatened with extinction during the postbellum period and seeking to lift themselves from despair, they engaged in violent rituals with the hope of restoring their self-esteem. Many Southerners acted with savage violence, assaulting freed men and women as though emancipation had degraded their humanity. 
they rode in the darkness, identifying themselves as knights of light and saviors of virtue to restore an idealized, fantasized, genteel way of life. The postbellum era included America's efforts to bind up the nation's wounds through Reconstruction. The Reconstruction era, sometimes identified with two different sets of dates, one set of dates being 1862 to 1877, another set being 1865 to 1877. The Reconstruction era cannot be discussed without acknowledging the deconstructive aggressions that sought to restore the social order of slavery and the Confederacy. Eric Fawner, speaking of Reconstruction notes, and I quote, the South's white community banded together to restore home rule, a euphemism for white supremacy. All told, Reconstruction was the darkest page in the saga of American history, end quote. Ashraf Rushni noted, and I quote, the kind of collective violence performed against African-Americans during Reconstruction was evidence of both the continuity and discontinuity of American life before and after the Civil War, end quote. Reconstruction is the period of American history demarcated by Civil War and post-Civil War agendas that redefined freedom through interpretations of slavery. Although the text of the war was slavery, the subtext of the war was a property dispute and capital gains. It's a given that war is violent. Yet the post-war work of forming a more perfect union was incredibly violent. The deconstruction component of reconstruction acted violently to continue the commodification and criminalization of black bodies in an effort to reconstruct the deconstructed Confederacy. Threatened with, with extinction during reconstruction, white supremacy acted with extreme violence against black bodies with the brutality of chattel slavery. Reconstruction, which was also the period of the Second Great Awakening, there were many plantations that were converted into penitentiaries. Blacks went from being seen as chattel and slaves for life to being incarcerated criminals for life. The Reverend Charles Finney, a leading preacher of the Second Great Awakening, inspired abolitionist and prison reform movements as acts of social transformation through Christianity. Yet, even these two Christian movements were not without their marginalizing undersides. John Chivington, an abolitionist Methodist minister who led the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864, and prison reform emphasized the separation of white and black inmates, believing penitence and reform was less likely among white prisoners if they were too close to black inmates. In 
So Finney was preaching social justice and transformation by way of the Christian narrative, and yet you still had these Christian movements that espoused death to an other, those that were not in agreement with by way of looking like what was identified as an American. Established on the tail of the devastation of war, reconstruction was counteracted by deconstruction agendas. Slavery's ideology of inequity with Africans having no rights under the law had already been established by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Dred Scott v. Sanford case, 1857. The decision made clear that the U.S. Constitution was not written to include blacks as American citizens. Not only was Southern slavery a manifestation of constitutional law as interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court, slavery in the South was the realization of the law written on the heart of Dixie. For the Southern property holder, the Dred Scott case was proof that they were justified in living by an ideology that blacks had no rights that whites had to respect. America, as the land of the free, has not been the land nor the home of the free for all. During a private conversation with Dr. Charles Long, he said to me, freedom is a felony for black folks. He spoke a present interpretation grounded in a historical reality. During the Civil War, enslaved Africans who escaped the Confederacy were not considered free once they arrived at Union soldier encampments. Instead of being free, they were given a new designation of contraband. James Oakes notes, property of whatever nature, used or capable of being used for warlike purposes, and especially when being so used, may be captured and held either on sea or on shore as property contraband of war." End quote. When enslaved Africans were chattel seeking freedom, they were denied the rights of Americans who grounded their identities on freedom. The law was actually devoted to maintaining chattel as the identity of Africans. Southerners' efforts to thwart progress during Reconstruction gave way to Jim and Jane Crow laws. Jim Crow was a caricature invented by the white mind, which became synonymous with black people. Consequently, Jim Crow laws were ordinances focused specifically upon black lives in relation to white lives. With the preoccupation for keeping blacks in their place, Jim and Jane Crow was another expression of the preponderance of slaveocracy governing social and political interactions. Blacks were regarded as being incapable of standing on equal and level ground with whites. Segregation, just as there was the big house and slave quarters, was the fundamental principle that guided the production 
of Jim and Jane Crow laws. The Southern ideology of separation and segregation became the national law of the land with the U.S. court decision on Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. This case declared separate but equal to be constitutional. The emphasis, however, was really upon separation since equality has never been a part of the superior inferior dynamics. The city of Tulsa, Oklahoma was a significant example of separate not being perceived as equal due to the racism that was built upon dualism and the dominant subordinate dynamic. The ideology of freedom that developed in the colonies was reestablished by the revolutionary period, emerged from the antebellum period, was redefined by the postbellum period, became reestablished during the reconstruction period with notions of inequality dominating its articulation. Tulsa settled in 1828 by the Creek Indians in what was Indian territory, Tulsa grew from being a tribal land with a trading post to a railroad stop for cattle industry to, into urbanization during reconstruction and an oil town prior to statehood. With Confederate culture blended with Indian life and a freedom mingled with self-determination, Tulsa became a land of opportunity in black and white and a prominent example of living separate combined with social intolerance that exemplified social inequity. Bishop Musen described Tulsa in 1921 as follows. The majority of white people living in Tulsa are just as fine people as can be found anywhere in America. Tulsa is a typical American city. There are few foreigners here. One seldom, if ever, hears any language other than English spoken here. Tulsa is neither a northern city nor a southern city. Vigorous, enterprising men are here from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kansas, as well as Missouri and Texas and the Old South. This is not a city where one would expect to find prejudice against the colored man as such. And there has been as little race prejudice here as one will find anywhere in America. Just this it is that makes the situation all the more serious. For if this thing happened in Tulsa, he's speaking of the riot, it may happen anywhere else. The Tulsa riot is a tragedy of more than local concern. It is an affair of national interest. It is indicative of a condition that calls for careful study by all patriotic, Christ-loving people. If this thing had happened in Savannah, Georgia, or in Houston, Texas, it might be charged up to Southern prejudice against the Negro. But happening in Tulsa, 
It calls for some other explanation. And it will happen in other cities. And again, and again, unless we get to the root of the matter and cure this social disorder at its very source. This is the most serious problem which America confronts. More serious to us than the Irish problem to the England or, or to England. There has never been anything like it in history. Two vigorous races as unalike as white people and colored people living side by side, end quote. Muzan was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina, either before or at the close of the Civil War. Although he was too young to know the Institute of Slavery firsthand, it was very likely that he was socialized to embrace the world of slavery, the world that slavery created, a Confederate world with deeply held beliefs on nature and nature's God. His description of Tulsa reflected an imaginary paradise lost by the Confederacy. His description of the citizens of Tulsa, having come from states in the North, South, and Midwest, who together created a new Western identity, was for him a shining example of an American city enjoying the fruits of its labor because it had embraced Jim Crow and not the integration proposed by Reconstruction. Enforcing the laws of Jim Crow, also known as the Black Codes, was experienced as an obligation of every law-abiding white person in America. Of course, there were abolitionists and integrationists, but the Southerners' commitment to restore the South to its social structure under slavery means a Christian theology of resurrection was truly paramount within the Southern heart. The statement that the South will rise again was a religious declaration and a battle cry of a faithful adherent to segregation. Consequently, lynching emerged as the terrorist initiated during Reconstruction to restore the faith of the Old South, and it became a compulsive behavior under Jim and Jane Crow as a ritual of compulsion. It petitioned God's favor. Lynching declared a new era in American life. Rusty noted, the bodies of African Americans previously owned now free, became the battleground for crucial issues that arose during the revolution and were left unresolved by the Civil War. Issues about race and citizenship, about popular sovereignty and the state, about forms of social control. Lynching emerged as one of the series of forms of violence meant to resolve these issues, end quote. The Tulsa Race Massacre, May 31st through June 1st, 
1921, has been identified as the worst race riot in the history of the United States. The event that precipitated the massacre began with a failed lynching that in actuality resulted in an entire cultural center being lynched. Popular descriptions of the massacre often misrepresent the context of the Greenwood District and the details of the violence. Documented by the Oklahoma Historical Society, lynching cannot be understood outside the general climate of racial violence that existed in early 20th century Oklahoma. This activity reached its lowest point in the Tulsa Race Massacre in June 1921. During the violence, a foiled lynch mob, enraged when confronted by angry, armed black Tulsans, marched to the Greenwood District and destroyed most of it and many of its residents, end quote. The community of Greenwood, known across America as Black Wall Street, was a bustling, economically thriving community. It was a self-determined, all-Black community within Tulsa's city limits. Famed for having all the markers of any thriving metropolis, it held businesses, entertainment, professionals, health services, hotels, home ownership, and proud people. The Greenwood District was a shining example of African-Americans living with prosperity. Historically identified as a riot, the actions that demarcated and decimated an entire community, which not only destroyed property, but also resulted in mass murder, is more accurately identified as a massacre. Not unlike the Sand Creek Massacre being originally identified as the Sand Creek Battle, the Tulsa Race Massacre was originally identified as the Tulsa Race Riot. This identification, however, was more than a description of racial conflict. It was identified as a riot in order to prevent black citizens from being able to make insurance claims on their losses. And just as the nature of the crimes against black humanity were covered by descriptions of white innocence, the white Tulsans assault on black life have been largely hidden within American history. For instance, before Pearl Harbor was bombed by a Japanese aerial assault in 1941, Black Wall Street was bombed by a white Tulsan aerial assault in 1921. After Indian internment camps, but before Japanese internment camps, African Americans who survived the assault in Tulsa were placed in concentration camps like contraband during the Civil War. Although Tulsa was segregated, there is evidence that pointed to a white intolerance of Black Wall Street appearing to be socially and economically equal. An intolerance 
to this community thriving. Separate but equal was the law of the land, but separate and unequal was the unwritten law of the white Tolson heart. As a result, the newspaper reporting the following or reporting followed the massacre suggested that the massacre was actually instigated by outside agitation, namely a visit to Black Wall Street by W.E.B. Du Bois. To this, Musin wrote in his sermon, there are many colored agitators at work. One must read the colored magazines and newspapers to see what colored people think and what they propose. Some of these periodicals burn with hate against the white man. There are Negro leaders who do hold steadfastly to the principles of Jesus and are laying foundations upon which our colored people may build for all time men like Booker T. Washington and his worthy successor, Robert Morton, Moton. There are others who have no constructive program. End quote. If Du Bois was exalting Black Wall Street as a talented, shiny example of prosperity and self-determination, his description stood not only in stark contrast to Muzin, but in direct opposition to the views of Muzin. This suggests why, within the white mind, Black Wall Street had to be destroyed. Identifying Black Wall Street as Little Africa, Muzin described Greenwood in this way. Little Africa had become one of the blackest spots in Oklahoma and we all knew it. Nobody dreamed of law being enforced there. All sorts of joints were in Little Africa. In Little Africa, where low dives were black and white, men and women mingled freely. Things were allowed to go on in Little Africa, which were not allowed to go on in the rest of the city of Tulsa." End quote. Diamond Dick Rowland was a shoe shiner in downtown Tulsa. While entering an elevator in the building where he worked, he accidentally stepped on the foot of the elevator operator, Sarah Page, who screamed. The accident was revised by people who heard the scream to accuse Roland of attempted rape, a crime often fabricated, fabricated against black men. And he was arrested. Sarah Page, however, never accused Roland of rape. It's been suggested that Roland and Page were actually secret sweethearts. A lynch mob gathered at the jail to remove Roland and execute Southern justice. When the men of Black Wall Street heard a mob was gathering, they organized to protect Roland a small group of armed World War I African-American veterans 
determined not to allow Roland to be lynched, stood between the jail and the mob. A member of the mob engaged in direct conflict with one of the African-American veterans. A shot rang out, but neither wounded nor killed a white Tolson. Yet that shot became the shot heard round the white Tolson community as a call to war. The exhibition of black resistance to the lynch mob for black humanity to dare to stand against white supremacy resulted in the mob's rage being directed on the community of Greenwood. More than 1,000 homes and businesses were destroyed with a death toll ranging upward of 300. Listen to Moosin's fake news telling of the precipitating events. The situation was unusual here in Tulsa. White men did not start the riot. Negroes started it. A rumor became current among the young Negro or that a young Negro was to be taken from jail and lynched. Numbers of white men heard the rumor and gathered about the jail to see what might happen. They were without arms. At no time was there any evidence that a mob of white men intended to break into the jail and kill the accused Negro. The rumor that a lynching was planned reached the Negroes in Little Africa also. According to the testimony of Negroes at the office of The Star, a Negro newspaper, was made their rallying point. Here, they assembled their arms and ammunition. Then they began to come in crowds, armed, some of them with high-powered rifles, into the city. They were in a bad mood. They refused to go home. Somehow, a shot was fired. Then the white men broke into stores and armed themselves. The city and county officials were incompetent or cowardly or both. For a time, 1,000 armed Negroes had the city at its mercy. Under such circumstances, there was nothing left for white men to do but to stand for the defense of their homes and the protection of their lives until help arrived." End quote. As a matter of social control, lynching was already well established as a practice in this area of the state. If the African-Americans of the Greenwood District heard a rumor that Roland was going to be lynched, the rumor did not originate with the Greenwood District. More accurately, it was not a rumor, but the rumblings that a mob was organizing to lynch Roland. Moosin's Alternative Facts presented the white mob as saviors instead of terrorists and murderers. As Dean 
of the theology department at Southern Methodist University, Musin's mission and ministry were guided by a theology of segregation. The Tulsa massacre, therefore, was shocking to him and required a God-given explanation that would put Tulsa and the rest of the nation back on track. Listen to another part of his sermon. Many colored leaders tell us honestly that they care nothing for social equality, but that what they ask is that there be a fair chance for men and women in the world. On the other hand, many colored leaders are agitating for this one thing. One needs only to read the colored newspapers and magazines to find this out. This lies at the root of the bitter, bitterness, race hatred on their part. Well, we say to them plainly, it will never be. As I once heard that brilliant writer, Bishop E.E. E. Haas say, God Almighty has drawn a color line in indelible ink. And the more that line is respected, the better it will be for both whites and blacks. We will see to it that here in America, there are separate hotels, separate schools, and separate churches. I end the quote here. Because now I want us to really consider the heart of his message and place it into more of a context of today for us gathered here in the Remind and Renew. Remind and Renew. One of the important questions for this centennial anniversary of the massacre is where do we go from here? Through the year, I've been saying we are living in the urgency of now. Charles Long spoke of history running in 100-year cycles. And we are currently within the throes of a significant series of events. Experiences from the past, 100 years ago, the terror and loss caused by a pandemic gave rise to terror and violence as racialized aggression. For 100 years ago, there was an influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. 100 years later, we have COVID-19. A hundred years ago, Red Summer of 1919, racialized violence identified as race riots in more than three dozen cities around the nation, but place that violence in context. This was the summer of 1919 in the midst of an influenza pandemic and folks were dying from a disease and yet they still took to the streets to violently assault African Americans in more than three dozen cities. And what did we find in this last summer in the throes of the pandemic? We found a nation that was protesting from coast to coast against racial violence. Trying to lift up 
humanity, and freedom and justice for all. One hundred years ago, November 2nd, 1920, there was what was identified as the Okoe Massacre. This happened on election day where a white mob killed residents and burned businesses and their homes in Okoe, Florida. The event occurred because African-Americans were seeking to vote that day in a presidential election and there was resistance to the black vote which resulted in a massacre and that town of Okoe became a white town, an all white town, a sundown town. In Florida, near Orange, excuse me, uh, it was in Orange County near Orlando and Sanford. And what did we just see? What did we just experience around the presidential election and voting? The claims of voter fraud and the claims of an election that was stolen and what resulted was a mob entering the Capitol, the 100 year cycle which we are still in the midst of. And so we examine the Tulsa massacre of 1921, where as we are still within a pandemic, an influenza pandemic. And so I close with the question that I've already raised, where do we go from here?